Hi everyone, and welcome to our webinar today for the MBA for Executives program at the Yale School of Management. We're thrilled to have you join us today to talk not only about the MBA for Executives, but also specifically to talk about the standardized test known as the Executive Assessment, sponsored by GMAC. So we're gonna do a little bit of a split presentation today with us here in New Haven in Evans Hall, talking to you a bit about the MBA for Executives program. And we're being joined by our colleague, Eric, who will introduce himself in a few minutes to talk about the Executive Assessment. And then we'll also take your questions as well. So please feel free to use the chat feature in the platform to tell us what questions you have about the program or about the executive assessment. My name is Joanne Legler. I'm the Director of Admissions for the MBA for Executives program and I'm thrilled to welcome you to our webinar today. And I'm joined by my colleague, David Daniel. Hi, I'm David Daniel. I'm an Assistant Director of Operations and Marketing here at the MBA for Executives. And we're also joined by our colleague, Eric Chambers from GMAC. Eric, do you want to say hello and just do a quick introduction? the market development team and um, you know, it's really just great to be a part of this so thank you for allowing me to join you today. Thanks so much Eric. Eric's joining us from afar uh, and we're here in Evans Hall. We're going to go ahead and get started with our webinar. Thanks again for joining us today everyone. Well, we're going to start by talking briefly about the MBA for Executives at Yale SOM. And I'm actually going to turn it over to my colleague David to tell you a little bit more about the program and the logistics of it to get us started. Sure. So the MBA for Executives runs over 22 months. Um, and so it runs in an every other week uh, format where you're here on a Friday, Saturday weekend. And so over the 22 months, that comes out to about 52 days out of the office. And then in addition to that, there are uh, four additional weeks that you'll be out of the office. So there's two in residence weeks at the beginning of your first year, another additional residence week at the beginning of your second year, and then one global network week between your first and second year. And so uh, to give you an idea of what those weekends look like, because those will be the majority of your time here, you show up at 9 a.m. bright and early on a Friday morning uh, for class. Uh, then you, uh, so you're in class all morning, you have a lunch, you then sit in a colloquium where we bring in industry experts from our different areas of focus to come speak with you. You have another class, and then we have an optional Friday cross-campus event. Saturday, uh, we start very early at 8 a.m. Uh, because we're mindful that this is a rigorous program and you're all very busy, and so we wanna give you as much of your day back as we can. So you have a class in the morning, lunch, another class in the afternoon, and then we have optional workshops. So we have a number of great events that we briefly allude to here. I encourage you, if you have questions, to take a look at some of our webinars. So to give you a, an idea of what our program looks like across those two years, so this is the structure of the curriculum. So um, in our first year, you take our, uh, our unique integrated core curriculum um, where all of our classes are, are perspectives based. Um, in your second year, you take uh, your advanced management courses as well as your area of focus courses. Um, that whole time, you'll be doing leadership development, uh, or leadership development program, pardon me, um, as well as our colloquia. And then in your second year, you'll also do uh, the self-directed study. So I will now hand it back to Joanne to speak about our areas of focus. Thanks, David. So I think one of the unique features of our program at the SOM uh, MBA for Executives is that we do indeed ask you to consider which of our three areas of focus you would like to dive deeper into. Of course, this will be directly related to not only your current work experience, but your future work experience as well. Um, and so while not every MBA out there for executives has this type of feature, we do feel lucky that we're able to have unique faculty directors um, who help drive these three really interesting areas of focus, all at the nexus of business in society. So we'll name drop a little bit here, but this is Tim Geithner um, talking to a class of students uh, in the asset management area of focus. Um, he does come here as a guest speaker for the global financial crisis class. Um, and so it's a really cool opportunity to hear from leaders in this space. And that's our first area of focus indeed is asset management. Headed up by faculty director, Professor Will Getzman, who is a Yale man through and through. He did all of his schooling here at, uh, at Yale. Um, and these are the classes that our students take in the second year. So our first year is very much about the core curriculum. Our second year, we move into both advanced management classes and specific classes in the areas of focus. 
So take a quick look at these, and as you consider whether or not Yale SOM might be the EMBA for you, do know that these are the classes that you will be asked to take in the second year in the asset management area of focus. As you can see, it's pretty heavy in investments and investment management. If that's the kind of work you do, that's the kind of work you hope to do throughout your career as an executive with the toolkit of an EMBA under your belt moving forward to you know, kind of grow and um, uh, move through into leadership positions in your space, this might be the right area for you. So take a look at these, look at our syllabus online, and I encourage you to really ask yourself if these are the exact classes that you wanna take. We think these are terrific classes that are headed up by some of our most rock star faculty in the finance um, and investment spaces here at SOM. Our second area of focus is almost kind of where it all began, which is healthcare. So the MBA for executives at Yale did start as a healthcare focused EMBA back in the day, and we've added two new areas of focus since. But it's always good to come back to basics and remember where we kind of started. And here's a great picture of our annual healthcare conference, which as a student at SOM, you're very welcome to come to. We hope, of course, that you will come and join us. Maybe you'll even be on a panel. This is just one of many panels that takes place. And the healthcare area of focus, uh, you would be very welcome to come and join us for the conference, which is a combination um, and a collaboration between students in the healthcare um, uh, space, both here at SOM, students from the medical school, the nursing school, and the School of Public Health here at Yale. So true collaboration across areas at Yale, bringing in the very best experts in the field. And this is all headed up by our fearless faculty director. His name is Dr. Howard Foreman, and how he was really kind of the grandfather uh, of the whole EMBA program, specifically with the focus on healthcare. These are the classes that students in that space will take in their second year, population health being the newest of those offerings. So again, a great opportunity here to dive in uh, and make sure that these are the classes that sound most interesting, enriching to your own career and experiences, um, and the most um, valuable for you to take as you consider your career moving forward. In the healthcare space, we're lucky enough to have practitioners, dentists, nurses, physicians, as well as folks in the medical device space, the insurance space, um, healthcare management organizations. So it's a true diverse group of students, all with the goal of trying to improve healthcare and healthcare outcomes uh, for populations here in the US and maybe even beyond. And then finally, our third area of focus is sustainability. Um, and this is a great photo of Kuhn Hall, just across the street from the School of Management and the home to the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Um, and this is a great space to go and study. As you can see, it's quite quiet. It's a really lovely space. Um, and it's very environmentally sound. It's, I think, LEED Gold certified or maybe beyond that. Um, and it absolutely is in line with the sustainability area of focus. So our faculty director for sustainability is Professor Todd Court, and Todd enjoys appointments both here at the School of Management and over at FES. Um, and the focus here is on, of course, thinking about how uh, organizations can be more responsible citizens, and it includes things like carbon footprints and carbon neutrality, um, and also thinking about responsible investing as well. So again, here are the classes that students in the second year take who have elected the sustainability area of focus. Great to look into these and dive in and make sure that you are excited about taking classes like climate change and that things like uh, managing sustainable operations makes sense for your current role or the roles that you hope to be uh, moving into in the future as well. Another really unique feature of our program is an opportunity for students to participate in something called Global Network Week. Students in the full-time MBA program have this opportunity and so do our students in the EMBA program as well. Yale is the sort of grandfather, again using that term, of the Global Network for Advanced Management which is a consortium of 30 top business schools around the world who work together to share resources, classes, faculty opportunities, um, and Global Network Weeks. Um, and so in June, uh, after your first year, our EMBA students are permitted and in fact required to take on a Global Network Week as part of their education here at Yale SOM. You can see from all these crisscrosses that the uh, network is really quite far reaching and it's quite wide. Um, and we would love for you to take an opportunity to go and explore a culture and a city and a country that might be quite foreign to you that you don't know anything about, but you're really excited to learn from experts in that space that tend to have something to do with the region as well um, and take a week and, and sort of expand your horizons in that way. So you'll see kind of flying through here all of the schools that are in the network. And as a student at SOM, you are also a student in the Global Network for Advanced Management. 
Unfortunately, not all of our schools have EMBA counterparts, but many of them do, and that's where we exchange for that week in June. We, of course, have students coming here to Yale SOM to do our Global Network Week, and we'll encourage our EMBA students to take advantage of one of these many cool opportunities. Perhaps it's something on the Future of Food, which was hosted by the Smurfit School in Ireland. We had students who went to the University of Ghana last year. So again, a really great opportunity to expand your horizons through the EMBA program, connecting with EMBA students from other schools around the network, expanding your own personal and professional network while you're at it. So I'm gonna turn it back over to David for a discussion about who attends the MBA for Executives program at Yale SOM. Who are our students and who is this best suited for? Great, thank you, Joanne. Um, so our students, uh, candidates well suited for this program are mid-career. Um, so they've had a strong trajectory thus far and they're looking to build a platform to really uh, accelerate as they continue in their career. Um, to give you an idea of some of the demographics of our students, so as of right now, they're uh, an average age of around 36, so that means about 12 years of professional experience. 35% um, women, although we're always looking to grow that, and 43% with some form of advanced degree. Um, and then also our students, 38% uh, of them are born abroad. And so as you can see, there's really a, a lot of diversity in our student body. Um, you know, there, there are not many lines that they're uh, aligned along in terms of their backgrounds and where they're coming from. Um, but what really brings our students together, uh, in addition to our areas of focus, is the purpose that aligns us here at the School of Management. So the, the mission of the School of Management is to educate leaders for business and society, um, which informs why we offer the areas of focus that we do. Um, and so as you can see, our students come united by that, that missional focus. Um, and they really form quite a community. As you can see from these pictures that are, are flashing by, uh, they develop a lot of relationships and uh, you know, while they're here every other weekend, uh, they really form uh, some very strong, tight-knit relationships um, and it's so much more than a network. Um, and so with that in mind, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you actually apply, how you get here uh, to the MBA for Executives. Um, so our admissions process is fairly straightforward. You submit an application by a round deadline. I will share those in just a minute. Uh, the admissions committee does uh, a review. Um, and then we extend uh, interview invitations to select candidates. After the interview, uh, our interview days, uh, we do another round of admissions committee review, and then we release our final decisions. Um, and as you'll see in just a second, that, that process is fairly transparent. We communicate all of those dates, and so I'll get to those in just a second. Uh, so with our application form, uh, you will need to submit several things. So you will submit a resume, two essays, two letters of recommendation, um, so the GMAT, the GRE, or the executive assessment, which we're actually here to talk about today. Um, you'll also need to submit transcripts for any undergrad or graduate work that you've done. Uh, your employer approval, which is really about sponsoring your time while you're here in the program, an application fee, and then if you are invited to interview, the interview is required. Um, and so our application deadlines are here, so we just finished our round one of applications. Um, our round two deadline is January 29th, and we will release our decisions by March 8th, 2019. And then finally, round three is, uh, the deadline is April 9th, and we will release decisions for round three by May 3rd. So if you've missed round one, never fear. There are still two more rounds in which you can apply, and there's still a good amount of time before uh, that round two deadline. Um, so yeah, I'm now going to hand it over to uh, Eric Chambers at GMAT to speak about the executive assessment in particular. Well, thank you so much, and what a terrific presentation as well. Love all your slides, and just <laughs> such a beautiful campus as well. Okay. Um, all right, so how do I control the, the presentation here? We're happy to do it for you, so oh, just let us know please. when the next slide comes. Yeah, and then I need to be able to see the actual presentation. Okay, no there we go. All right, thank you for that. Technology. Sorry. Yeah, so, sorry. Uh, thank you for your patience with me. Okay. Um, so I guess I just wanted to first start out with, you know, how the executive assessment came out. And so the um, executive MBA programs came to us and, and uh, said, you know, the GMAT's a, a great test, um, but it may just be a little too much for us. You know, we don't, we don't need all the 
um, you know, bells and whistles that come with um, that kind of an exam. And, and our students are, um, uh, you know, they're busy people. We need a basically a readiness uh, test for them. And so something that had a reasonable amount of study time, a reasonable amount of time to actually take the exam, but still gave some great information both to the school and to the, uh, to the candidates. And so with that, there were, um, you know, sort of four really drove um, uh, what the executive assessment, how it was designed. And so David, I don't know if you can pull those up for me, but um, so one was again, focused on readiness. And so it's not so much of a, uh, something that the schools are using to screen people out um, amongst you know qualified candidates. It really was to confirm readiness. So, uh, are you prepared to perform academically within the program? And if you weren't, um, you know, if you were you were close, but you felt like you needed some, or the school felt like you needed some additional help, the school could then do that based on the results. And so they can assign uh, you know boot camps or classes or. Uh, some math modules, things of that nature. Um, we certainly wanted to make sure that it was relevant to the candidates that were taking it. And so that's why we start out with the integrated reasoning section as the first section, because it's it's most like what you do at work and uh, most what you will be expecting to do when you're in school. Um, again, I mentioned the convenience factor. So again, not a long exam, uh, not requiring a tremendous amount of, of prep before taking it. And then we added in, uh, because obviously you all are busy people and it's not unusual for you to walk into work on Monday and maybe have a boss come to you and say, hey, I need you in London on uh, you know, uh, Wednesday. And so we removed all of the rescheduling fees and also your ability to send your scores to as many schools as you'd like. And then in the end, uh, the, you know, of course, the last thing is, which is critical is that it had to be a quality exam. So it had to be a rigorous exam. It had to be something that was you know, really going to make sure that it, it measures what it's supposed to be measuring, um, but also ensures that you feel confident with uh, the quality of candidates that are, um, you know, in your programs as well. And so with that, the, um, the sort of quote that I thought really was helpful um, was that, you know, the assessment really should feel less like a hurdle and more like an opportunity to confirm readiness. So again, confirming readiness for you and confirming readiness for, uh, for the schools. So let me tell you a little bit more um, about it, sort of how it works, and, and you can actually um, light all these up if you'd like for me. And so again, it was created really for experienced professionals. Again, it's focused on readiness. It's section adaptive, which is different than the GMAT, which is uh, question adaptive, and I'll show you that. Uh, you do have the ability to review and edit uh, when you're in a particular section. Again, I'll point that out when I get to the uh, couple of slides from now. Uh, it's a shorter exam than the GMAT or the uh, GRE, so it's 90 minutes versus uh, roughly three hours for the GMAT and, and longer for the GRE. Uh, fewer questions, 40. Uh, there are only three sections, though, with this. It's the integrated reasoning section, verbal reasoning, and quantitative reasoning. Uh, the GMAT uh, includes an analytical writing assessment, um, uh, and so GRE also has something that's similar to that. Uh, we, we call the prep light, um, but when we surveyed the students that uh, took the exam last year, they were telling us that they studied about 20 to 30 hours for it. Um, but certainly that varies quite a bit based on uh, where people are sort of in a comfort level with the questions. You know, some people just took a weekend or a couple of weekends, others took a little longer. Um, so again, it, um, but 20 to 30 hours, I think is also a good way to think about, are you ready for school? So if uh, you know, when you're in school, you're going to need to set aside, you know, that amount of time, probably in a typical week or maybe over a two-week period, uh, you know, just to focus on your studies. And so this is, again, a, a good way to, to think about uh, preparing. So in some ways, I'd, I'd sort of look at the executive assessment as your first business school course, and the exam itself is your first business school exam. Uh, the total does include all three sections, which is a little bit different than the other exams. Uh, the score range is 100 to 200. We want to make sure that it, it was different than the other exams. Uh, we do provide accommodations, so if you need extra time on the exam or you need someone to read questions to you, that sort of thing, there's an application process for that. And then if you're confirmed for those accommodations, then we will help you schedule your appointment because, again, we may need to reserve a, a double slot for you. Um, the fee structure, uh, it's, it's $350. Um, there are no rescheduling fees, so you can reschedule as often as you'd like, up to uh, 48 hours before the exam. And you can send your scores to as many schools uh, that you're interested in. 
right now there's only a ma there's a maximum of two attempts on it. Uh, and again, this does help to back up the, the readiness philosophy uh, that we have, um, which is, again, this isn't an exam you just keep taking to try to get a higher score. Uh, you know, you want to study appropriately, uh, you, then you want to go in and be able to take the exam and then your results you know, are provided to the school. For most people, that's enough. Um, occasionally, uh, a candidate maybe didn't feel like they, did, they didn't prepare as well, or uh, they just weren't feeling well that day. Uh, you know, something of that nature. And so then uh, that would be a good reason to take it a second time. Uh, you can take this in any one of our uh, Pearson View uh, test centers around the world. So there's over 600 of those. So obviously if you're busy traveling, you, you have lots of options. Um, you can take the exam pretty much, you know, Monday through Friday or th through Saturday, I'm sorry, Monday through Saturday, uh, mornings, afternoons, uh, early evenings, uh, the Saturday appointments probably fill up a little quicker than most, obviously, because a lot of working professionals are are taking uh, this exam. So if you're going to, when you do register, I would maybe look at those. You know, if we're going to think about a Saturday, then certainly um, try to skip a little earlier than sooner than later. And then the last thing is uh, to, to register for, you just go to gmac.com forward slash EA. And so just again, to, to, well, to go to the next uh, piece here about the exam itself, again, as I mentioned, there are three sections. Each section are 30 minutes each. Um, you can see how many questions are in there. But let me show you the, the next slide, which I'll show you how this works as an adaptive uh, exam. And so um, what we do is we serve up a middle set of six integrated reasoning questions. So everyone will get, again, sort of middle tier type questions. And then depending on how you do on those, we'll then get, provide you with an easier set or a harder set of integrated reasoning. That, again, that, that section, 30 minutes. Uh, there's no breaks in this exam, by the way. So 30 minutes. Now, depending on how you did on the integrated reasoning section, because verbal reasoning and quantitative reasoning are correlated with integrated reasoning, but there's still some other things that integrated reasoning offers that those two sections don't, we can then take your results from the integrated reasoning section and then route you to a, a sort of an easier section or a harder section of verbal questions. Depending on how you do um, with, that, with that portion, we will then route you to another set of questions. And again, easier, medium, or harder. And again, that is also 30 minutes. For, and then we start over again, right? So um, then you'd be routed over to the quantitative section and go through the same process. So again, 90 minutes, 40 questions, um, in and out, again, no breaks. All right, so then let me just move on to the next um, slide here. Uh, just something for you to be aware of when you do come into the test center. Um, you, will be, you will bring an ID. Uh, so if you're a US citizen, that's your, your driver's license. If you're not a US citizen, this is in the United States, by the way, I apologize. If you're, if you're in your home country, it would be the, the, you know, the driver's license. Uh, the, if you're not in your home country, then you need to bring a passport. <laughs> okay. So um, they will take a digital picture of you. They will also take a digital signature. Um, you will put all of your things into a locker. So when you go in to take the exam, you leave everything in your locker, uh, including your phone, uh, you know, your keys, and, and so on. And so you'll only take in maybe a light um, you know, sweater, um, you know, obviously your, your glasses, that sort of thing. But again, everything else you just leave uh, in the locker. They will provide you with uh, a left-hand friendly pen, uh, as well as these sort of laminated sheets that you see uh, on the right. Um, when I say left-handed, uh, the folks out there that are left-handed you know, will certainly understand. That means that it doesn't smear as you write, um, you know, from left to, to right. Um, uh, what is what is interesting about this exam is that at the end of the exam, you will see your you'll get your official results right there. They'll hand them to you, and then within about 24 hours, we will give them to the schools, and we'll also provide them to you in an online format. Uh, so you know, uh, the nice thing is if you're hitting one of these deadlines for the schools, um, you can you know obviously you'll get your scores. You can go and then type them into uh, your application and submit it that same day. Um, moving on to the next uh, slide, um, just here's a couple of things that you may want to think about as you're preparing to study. One is you, you've got to be honest with yourself about what your learning style is. And so what I mean by that is some people are, are good at studying by themselves. Other folks need a, a tutor or a partner. Uh, some people need a little small study group. Um, some people need a course. Um, so 
it's completely up to you. There's all those are all good options. Um, again, you just want to be honest with yourself about that. You also need to be disciplined. So part of that is when you when you set up your planning uh, for studying and you're thinking, OK, I'm going to study 20, 25 hours, maybe something like that. OK, break that out across a couple of weeks, perhaps, um, or some weekends. But, you know, really stick to it. Um, cause obviously if you're, if you're not able to stick to it, that's going to really delay things quite a bit. Um, the, 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 sort of the last part, I guess, with, you know, sort of how long it takes to study is really, again, how comfortable are you with the subject matter and the question types? Um, and again, that's just, that's something that you'll just, as you're using some of the software, which I'll show you here in a minute, uh, that, that will provide you with some good information. There's also a couple of full length computer adaptive test that we provide, which I think is a good place to um, start maybe after you review the, the question formats uh, first. And then the last thing is to really try to simulate test center conditions as much as you can. And I don't mean like build a, you know, a cubicle at your house or you know, at your office or something like that. But what it means is, uh, is you know, get, get away from the phone, get away from the TV, get away from the music. Um, you know, don't be making dinner while you're preparing for this. You know, you really just want to have something that's more like what it's really going to be to take the test. Uh, certainly using our, our free software is a good start with that. And then, you know, have learning objectives. So uh, are you working on your quantitative reasoning questions today? Or are you working on your pacing? Uh, things of that nature. And so let me talk about some of the prep materials uh, that we do have. Um, they are, you know, specific to EA. So uh, we have lots of questions. There's actually a, a a very good number of free questions that are on our website, again, gmac.com forward slash EA. Uh, but if you want other questions, uh, we have those. If you want to just focus on the integrated reasoning section or if you want more uh, more work in that area, we have software for that. And then also with um, uh, the assessments that I mentioned, which are these full length computer adaptive uh, EA exams that are scored. And so they will be very, very close to what it's like when you really take the exam, I mean, in the sense of the score that you receive on those. But they will look and feel exactly like the real exam, because obviously, um, you know, we're, we're, we're using, you know, real retired questions and using the same algorithm. And so the, and the fonts and the colors and everything else are all the, uh, all the same that what you see when you take the exam. And so the, the last part um, here, um, so the next slide would be, um, you know, trying to show you some sample questions. But Joanne, let me ask you: uh, Would you do you want me to show you these, or should, or should we show these, or should we move on to questions? I'd love to show these. We have plenty of time, Eric. Sure. So if you're okay. up for it, right. let's go through them. So the the first uh, types of questions you're going to get are the integrated reasoning questions, and so there are four integrated reasoning question types. So on the left, you see a multi-source reasoning question. And here, I don't know if you can see it, but right up above email number one there, the first tab, it says, a, it says calculator. So this is the only section where there's a calculator. It's a very, very basic calculator. And so when you study for uh, EA, you're gonna wanna use that calculator. Uh, you don't wanna use your own. You're not gonna be bringing in your own calculator uh, in the test center. You won't be using the keyboard uh, and so forth. Uh, many people actually don't even end up using the calculator. So it's just there as an aid if you need it. Uh, but again, it's only in this one particular section. But these multi-source reasoning questions are, are interesting. Again, much like what you deal with at work, uh, you've got three emails here. Uh, the first one, you know, maybe states a problem, maybe ask some questions. Uh, the next one, maybe it's a graph, a chart, maybe it's a table, maybe it's just again somebody else providing this information. Um, and the last one might be somebody who's just thrown in some additional information, which might be helpful, may not be helpful. So again, much like work where Everyone wants to contribute, but um, some information is more helpful than others. And so what you'll do is you'll integrate those uh, different pieces of information, um, you know, those different formats and, and uh, data or information that you're receiving, and you're going to answer multiple questions, which you see on the right. Uh, the next type of, of question type is table analysis, and so that's the one on the right. And you can see you've got a table, and then below that you have some information about what, what are you looking at. So what is this table? And then on the far right, you've got, you have multiple questions uh, to answer. But what, what is interesting about this is that you do, I don't know if you can see, but the sort by button uh, where it's just a drop down, and then you pick the, the columns that you want to sort. So it's, it's nothing uh, super fancy. It's not like a pivot table or anything of that nature. It's just a, a drop down, and you can sort 
uh, the, the columns that you want, again, to help you answer some of the, the questions. So that's table analysis. Then we have um, a couple of more. One is graphics interpretation. And so as you can see here, you've got a graph uh, or a chart or you know a histogram, right? So that's what you're gonna end up seeing. And then they're gonna tell you what you're, what you're actually looking at um, to explain that. And then below you have a couple of questions that are just uh, some drop downs. So it's a multi-choice in that regard. Um, and then on the, uh, on the far right, then you have two-part analysis. And so this is a, a question where you have to pick a, an answer in A and a question in B. And so this is uh, basically, they're talking about two companies that are growing at different rates and when does one take over the other one. But um, so that's, that's what you're dealing with there. Uh, and then if we move on to the uh, verbal reasoning um, questions or yeah, quantitative, I thought it was maybe verbal. <laughs> I guess I have these a little out of order, right? You wouldn't actually start, well, you wouldn't go to quantitative, actually go to verbal, but here's, here's an example of some quantitative reasoning questions, right? So here's a problem solving question, which is basically a math problem. Um, and so, um, uh, so if you know the equation, great. It's just basically an algebra question. So if you, if you know the equation, great. If you don't, then you, what you want to try to use is your quantitative reasoning skills. And so if you can think about, should this question end with an even number or an odd number, right? You're going to be able to narrow it down to either three or two. And then you can either re reverse engineer the math or you can just guess. Uh, and, you know, again, if you're down to two, you at least got a 50% chance of getting it right. So the next type of quantitative reasoning question is called data sufficiency. Uh, interesting in that the A to E options available to you uh, may be a little confusing and maybe even a little frustrating uh, when you first start to uh, go through these questions. And so you'll get a question like this where it's just asking what's the probability that a boy will read in a, in a class uh, where someone is chosen randomly. And then you're given two statements. So one of them tells you that two thirds of the students in the class are boys. So from that, you can tell, you do know what the answer is if you were, again, you're trying to provide what the probability is. So you've got that. You've got that with the first uh, statement here. With the second statement, it says 10 of the students in the class are girls. Okay, well that's helpful, but you need an additional piece of information. You need to know how big the class is. And so you can't uh, determine what the probability is based on that one, uh, based on the second statement. You can with the first, but you can't with the second. And so then down below, you have these different options. And so you'll see that, that uh, uh, answer A is actually the correct answer, which is statement A alone is sufficient, but statement two alone is not sufficient. And then the other ones are just a com you know, different combinations, so you have to pick the, the right one. But here, the answer A would have been correct. So those are data sufficiency. So as soon as you understand the A to E uh, options that are available to you, these will be a lot easier and, and actually fairly interesting and kind of fun to do. Um, the next one is a uh, problem, well, I'm sorry, the next one, there, there we go. So, um, I'm sorry, moving into verbal reasoning. So in verbal reasoning, we have three types. Um, the first one is, um, let me just make sure we got this in the right order. So if we could go to the next slide, there we go. Uh, reading comprehension, which is, you're probably used to this. Uh, again, this is much like at work, uh, you know, and certainly you're gonna get a lot of this in school where you're gonna, you're gonna have a lot of reading. Uh, you're going to have this passage. Um, and then what, what is interesting, though, the difference between uh, when you go to business school and, and much like at work, you know, they're not going to ask you questions about in what date was this or who did this exactly. You know, it's really focused on the, what you're seeing on the right, which is they'll ask you a question about the author of this passage is primarily concerned with. Right. So it's really do you really comprehend what you're reading? Are you really getting a good sense of the takeaways here? Uh, which again plays out, uh, you know, very strongly in the workplace, and obviously will play out uh, very strongly in the classroom. So that's reading comprehension. Uh, the next one is critical reasoning, and so these are pretty interesting. Um, you know, you end up with a statement like like above, right, where it says, you know, a city wants to attract new citizens and new housing with and new facilities such as parks, recreation centers, and libraries. But one component of the city's plan is that they require developers seeking permission to build this new housing. Uh, uh, you know, in additional facilities at no cost to the city. And so then the question that comes to you, which is, which of the following, if true, would point to a possible flaw in the city's plan? And so you can see down in uh, answer D, 
which is basically says the developers would pass along the cost, thereby raising the cost of housing beyond the ability of likely um, buyers. And so there's some people look at these as, as sort of common sense, um, but again, uh, very much what you would do at work and what you would do you know, when you're in school looking at uh, some of the, the things are being thrown at you and, and you know, where is there a potential you know, problem you know, with uh, approaching it this way. And then the last one is, is you know, just sentence correction. And so um, you know, for some of you, it just means you're gonna need to brush off your, um, you know, your grammar skills. Uh, what's interesting on these is um, non-native English speakers actually do better on these questions than native speakers because native speakers go with what sounds right uh, as opposed to what is correct. And um, so anyway, uh, so again, you may just need to dust off some of those grammar skills. But uh, so that's, those, those are the question types. Um, you know, happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Uh, Joanne, I think it's back to you, obviously. Uh, lead us through that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks so much, Eric. That's incredibly helpful. I hope our audience found that helpful as well. Uh, the next slide we have up is if you do have additional questions, you're welcome to contact us in the EMBA admissions office here at Yale SOM through our uh, email address. You're welcome to send us any questions that you have. Uh, if you have questions specifically about the executive assessment or the GMAT or other exams, uh, GMAC of course has their own website. Here we have the URL uh, for the website specific to the executive assessment. We do have a number of questions that have come in, so we have about eight minutes left, so we'll try to get through as many of those as we can. Um, a couple of these are a bit more specific to the admissions process, so I think we'll start here um, and talk a little bit about how the EA uh, fits in with the uh, opportunity to apply for admission at Yale SOM for the MBA for Executives program, but Eric, we've got a couple for you as well. So let's go through maybe David and I a couple of questions that pertain specifically to admissions at SOM, um, and we'll take the first one because it's easy. If somebody has 15 or more years of work experience, is it still um, uh, uh, compulsory for them to take a standardized test? And the answer is yes. So you see David nodding and I'm nodding. We don't offer exceptions or waivers for the standardized test portion uh, of the admissions requirements. Uh, for us, that helps uh, understand a little bit more about your readiness for the program. Eric has really emphasized that the executive assessment is about readiness for an EMBA program. Um, and it helps us in admissions to both understand your readiness um, and your academic prowess and readiness for the academic portion of the MBA for Executives. Uh, the MBA for Executives Anywhere is not for the faint of heart, especially here at Yale SOM. Um, and so it is absolutely critical that every single person does apply with a required test score. If you wanna take the EA, that's great. I think we've really proven here today that that's a terrific opportunity for students who are busy professionals and will be working full time and going to school uh, here every other weekend. But if you prefer the GMAT for uh, any reason, or if you're still thinking about maybe a full time program or an executive program, the GMAT may be a better choice. Uh, the GRE is also available to you, but no exceptions and no waivers. Um, David, I'll pass this one over to you. Um, the um, EA is one of three choices that we offer. How does the EA or taking the EA or submitting an EA score, how would that affect a person's application as opposed to doing a GMAT or a GRE? Is, is there really any difference in the process? Uh, so the short answer to that is no, there's no difference in the process. Uh, we're, we're willing and happy to take any of the three exams. Um, so the, the difference in the, there is no difference in the process. That being said, uh, we strongly encourage you to take the executive assessment. Uh, it's an exam designed for, for candidates and prospective students looking for programs like ours. Um, it also provides us very specifically the information that we need to know, whereas the GRE or the GMAT honestly provide us more than we need to. Um, so on our end, when the difference is minimal, and on your end, when it can mean significantly less prep time and and an exam that's really designed for you and your needs, our recommendation is pretty strongly to take the executive assessment. That being said, if you really would like to take the GRE or the GMAT, or you may have just done so, we have no preference, so feel free to apply with either of those scores. But if you're at a place where you're really thinking about what should I be taking now, the executive assessment is probably the right answer for you. And David wrote a terrific blog post, which is available on our website, about whether or not the EA is right for you. The answer is almost always yes, but um, I'll point you to that blog post and just um, encourage you to go ahead and read up on that. Um, 
uh, get his thoughts from the admissions perspective. Um, I'll take the next one, which again should be pretty quick. Um, some schools will communicate with prospective EMBA students on their grades or on their test scores uh, and to see whether or not they are acceptable. A similar question here is what is the score range or the average for the EA needed for the MBA for executives here at Yale? If you do take the exam and you wanna to talk to one of our admissions staff members about how you've fared and how that may impact your application, we'd be very happy to talk to you about that opportunity. So please feel free to send us an email. You might get a phone call with David or myself or Maria or Liz, anybody on our team would be very happy to talk to you. Um, as far as a range or an average goes, we don't talk a whole lot about that quite yet, in part because the numbers of students that we see taking the EA over the last year and a half, which is as long as we've accepted the EA as an acceptable test for admission, is quite small. Um, and while we see the numbers rise uh, every round of application that we have, we still don't quite have enough data to really be able to go out there publicly with what we consider to be a range or an average. Having said all that, we're very happy to tell you that a 150 EA with a 10 on each subsection of, this, of the exam would be absolutely what you you should shoot for. That's what we feel like gives us the confidence to mark your application as absolutely ready for the academic uh, rigor of an EMBA program here at Yale SOM. Uh, but again, happy to talk to you if you have any questions about that. I'd love to turn it back over to Eric for two questions. And this is really, Eric, about readiness and opportunities that students will have to practice questions. Uh, so the first question is, are there any prep courses for EA prep along with the questions on the website? What's out there, either what GMAC as an organization offers or maybe some other organizations yeah, well, offers? I, mean, I think with prep, with prep courses. courses, it really is up to, you know, the individual, you know, do they need that much, you know, um, you know, sort of all the bells and whistles that come with a prep course. Uh, most of the students are just going to use the materials that, that we provide. Those are uh, sufficient for most people, but certainly understand that, you know, um, sometimes it's very helpful to, to, to meet with others in a more formal environment, you know, have some experts really helping you out, um, helping to dust the cobwebs off a little bit with some of the, you know, especially the math and so forth. So, um, you know, certainly that's, that's a good option. It's, it's going to be the more expensive option, uh, of course, is something to, to um, include. The only, um, you know, since the test is fairly new, so it was launched in, in March of 2016 and has really taken off over the last uh, couple of years, um, you know, the, the test prep companies were, were kind of in a wait and see uh, to see if there would be demand there. Um, they certainly are starting to see demand, um, but I think the only one right now that I know of that offers a prep program specific for the executive assessment is Manhattan Prep. Um, and so if you were just to, you know, to, to, you know, look on their website, I'm sure that, you know, it'd be listed there. Um, I don't have a lot of, I mean, I know some of the details about it, but um, again, that's the only one I know of right now. It doesn't mean that some other mm -hmm. uh, prep uh, organizations will be coming out with something more specific to EA. Now, of course, they also, you know, um, teach GMAT, which is, you know, the, the you know, and, and by the way, you know, the company I work for, the Graduate Management Admission Council, we, you know, we own uh, and are um, the stewards of both the GMAT and the executive assessment. So we're not involved with GRE, but we were involved with the GMAT. And so uh, when we first launched this test, a lot of people just use the GMAT prep materials uh, to, to study for the executive assessment, which is perfectly fine. So um, if someone wanted to do a course that was focused on the GMAT, that maybe it was shorter, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, something that really fit their schedule, that, that could also be a good option. Just again, just don't pay attention when they're talking about the analytical writing assessment, because you don't have to take it with the executive assessment. Great. Thanks so much, Eric. I have one more question for you. Is there an opportunity on the GMAC website for a cost-free simulated practice exam? I think you covered this a little bit, but maybe to underscore the point, for students who are interested in actually taking the, uh, an entire exam from start to finish in practice, yeah, mode, well, what are the options um, that the are exam, so We don't have free, we don't, uh, free ones, um, but they're, they're not expensive at all, right? So, but there are uh, there's some software you can download, uh, which includes lots of questions, but also includes uh, two full-length computer adaptive tests that are scored. They're, it's exactly what you're going to experience when you take the real exam in, in, a, in a test center. Um, now, GMAT uh, official uh, prep we have for the GMAT, uh, if you were to set up an account on MBA.com, you don't have to register for an exam, but you can, you can download GMAT prep, and that would give you some free software. Um, but again, those are full-length computer adaptive GMAT exams, uh, which is not going to have the same, you know, feel it's obviously much longer um you know there's more to it so 
Uh, the other thing too is that with the executive assessment, you don't have things like geometry. So if you're using the GMAT prep, uh, if you come across a geometry question, just skip it. Great. Thanks so much, Eric. Uh, we've hit our 45 minute mark. We realize that there may be a couple of questions out there that we weren't able to get to, so we've just advanced the slides one last time to show you where you could find more information about how to contact the EMBA admissions office, and we welcome your questions, uh, whether they come now after the webinar, if we weren't able to get to your questions today, or at a later time. Um, today is December 11th. We are 10 days away from um, going away for the holiday break, so we invite your questions between now and December 21st. We look forward to re uh, answering your questions when we come back after the new year. So happy new year to everybody. Best of luck with your test preparation. I want to thank David for being here today from the admissions team um, as well as our staff who's helping on the back end and thanks so much to Eric Chambers from the uh, GMAC organization for being here today as well. We wish you all the best of luck with your test, your test prep and invite your questions. Best of luck for the new year and we hope to see you in person soon. Thanks for joining us today.